defense of war and just cause sinless. And it was preached on the day of the Continental Fast by David Jones. And this was printed in 1775. And he takes the scripture from Nehemiah 4, 14. And I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, Be not ye afraid of them. Remember the Lord which is great and terrible and fight for your brethren, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your houses. And I could imagine uh, Jones with the reputation uh, of, of being a fiery preacher. Yeah. I can imagine how it must have been for him to preach this message. And he begins, when a people become voluntary slaves to sin, when it is esteemed a reproach to reverence and serve God, when profaneness and dissolute morals become fashionable, when pride and luxury predominate, we cannot expect such a nation to long be happy. Israel, when first planted in the land of Canaan, were a brave, heroic, and virtuous people, being firmly attached to the true worship of God. They were both formidable and invincible. When their armies went forth to battle, thousands and tens of thousands fell before them. Thus being clothed with the majesty of virtue and true religion, a panic seized the hearts of all their enemies around them. But when vice and immorality became prevalent, when they forsook and rebelled against their God, they lost their martial spirit and were soon enslaved by the king of Babylon. Yet, as God is gracious and merciful, when seventy years were expired in this furnace of affliction, he remembered their low estate and stirred up Cyrus, king of Persia, to proclaim liberty for the Jews to return and build their temple at Jerusalem. Nevertheless, some of the people still remained in Persia, of which Nehemiah was one. He was a favorite in the days of Artaxerxes, the king. Therefore, he obtained leave to go and build the walls of that ancient city, Jerusalem. But when Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite, and Geshem the Arabian heard that there were men come to seek the welfare of the Jews, they were filled with indignation. Therefore, in scornful language, they bring a state accusation against them, saying, What is this thing that you do? Will you rebel against the king? However, though they treated the Jews with scorn and insult, yet their labor became a subject of conversation. Send Ballot once speaking on the occasion, Tobiah makes a reply to this effect. Tush, Send Ballot, it is not worth your notice, nor should you give yourself the least concern about these feeble wretches. They build indeed, but if a fox in his meanders was to ascend their stone wall and only give a few scratches, it would fall down. These scornful insults were spoken that the Jews might hear them and be discouraged. But when they saw that the work went on with rapidity, they were filled with the highest indignation and resolved if bitter taunts, the swords of their mouths would not discourage them. Their swords of steel should compel them to cease from their work. Therefore, Sinbalat, Tobiah, the Arabians, the Ammonites, and the Ashdodites all conspire together to come with their united force against Jerusalem. Their design was made known to Nehemiah, and as all should do, especially in distress, he lifts up his eyes to heaven and makes his supplication to the Lord of hosts. Nor does he think his preservation shall be effected in neglect of the use of means. Therefore he sets a watch against them day and night and addresses himself to all ranks of people in these spirited and excellent words. Be not ye afraid of them. Remember the Lord which is great and terrible and fight for your brethren, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your houses. In these words observe. One, a caution against cowardice or fear of an enemy unjustly enraged. Be not ye afraid of them. It is of great importance in war to be delivered from fear of the enemy, for soldiers in a panic generally fall a victim in the dispute. Two, we have an argument to excite fortitude and firmness of mind in martial engagements. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible. Three, 
a servant called to present duty in times of distress and fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses to improve the word suitable to the occasion of the present solemnity, the following order shall be attempted. An endeavor shall be made to prove that in some cases, when a people are oppressed, insulted, and abused, and can have no other redress, it then becomes our duty as men, with our eyes to God, to fight for our liberties and properties. Or in other words, that a defensive war is sinless before God. Consequently, to engage therein is consistent with the purest religion. Here's some text in the New Testament which present some good men or prevent some good men from engaging in the present dispute shall be considered. Two, some particulars shall be presented to our consideration to demonstrate the alarming call which we now have to take up arms in our own defense. Three, a few arguments shall be advanced to excite fortitude in martial engagements. And lastly, lastly, some inferences shall be drawn. The subject before us is of great importance. It is to be lamented that we have the present occasion to consider it. It is very copious. And as it is new to me, brevity and great accuracy can scarcely be expected. If God shall enable us to consider each proposition consistent with his honor and worthy of his majesty, we may rest satisfied. Your attention, my brethren and countrymen, is begged while an endeavor is made. One, to prove that in some cases when a people are oppressed, insulted, and abused, and can have no other redress, it then becomes our duty as men with our eyes to God to fight for our liberties and properties, or in other words, that a defensive war is sinless before God. Consequently, to engage therein is consistent with the purest religion. If antiquity, if the united voice of all kingdoms that now or ever have existed could be admitted as a proof, the point would easily be determined, for there has been no kingdom, whether composed of Jews or Gentiles, barbarians or Christians, but have embraced it as their common creed that a defensive war is innocent. But though this is a presumptive argument, yet it must be confessed that it is not a decisive proof, for ancient mistakes are mistakes, and a multitude may be wrong. But if this proposition can be made appear from the Holy Scriptures, as we profess them to be our only rule of faith and practice, then it must be acknowledged that a defensive war is sinless and consistent with the purest religion. To them, let us repair with attentive ears to hear what the lively oracles of God will say on this point. Among all the ancient servants of God, None is more famous for true piety and pure religion than the patriarch Abraham. To him the highest epithets are given. He is more than once called the friend of God. In his steps the righteous are to walk. To him were many great and precious promises made, and yet we find this great, this holy man firmly of the faith, that a defensive war is sinless. He makes a bright display of his faith. When the four kings took Lot, his brother's son, captive, doth his religion prevent his pursuit of the enemy? No, verily, with a heart dependent on the Most High God, he collects his servants and some confederates. With martial weapons in his hands, he pursues the foes and utterly discomfits the four kings and triumphantly brings back the captives with all the spoil. This was the very time that Melchizedek, the priest of the Most High God, met him. And did he reprove or curse him? No, says the text. He brought forth bread and wine, giving him the highest expressions of approbation. He thus addressed him, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thine hand. Amen. This passage proves not only that this was Abram's belief, but also that Melchizedek, 
priest of the Most High God, Melchizedek, the brightest type of Christ, was fully of the same opinion and therefore may be admitted as an evidence in favor of a defensive war. Yes. For any of us to presume that we have a better conscience than Melchizedek would argue either pride or ignorance. If we trace the sacred history of the sin to succeeding ages, we shall find that Moses is of the same faith. Among all the children of men, none was more meek and admitted to greater familiarity with God than Moses. He is often called by way of eminence Moses, the servant of God. Amen. By his hands we receive the lively oracles of God, and the apostle bears him witness that he was faithful in all things. Right. Yet we find him often engaged in bloody battles. One instance may suffice at present out of many that might be produced. And that is when, on the most reasonable terms, he requested to pass through the land of Sihon, king of the Amorites, pledging his honor that no damage should be done. But Sihon, instead of granting the small privilege of passing along the highway, advances with all his armies against Israel. Doth Moses think it is his duty to make no defense? Let us view his conduct. Israel advances with sword in hand and utterly destroys the Amorites. If we read the book of Joshua, his immediate successor, we shall find him of the same mind. Israel are called the peculiar people of God to whom his mind was revealed. And this is the faith of the whole house of Israel. If it was a sin to engage in a defensive war, can we suppose that Israel should be ignorant of it? Seeing therefore that it is sinless. It is me that we should tread in the footsteps of this flock which has gone before us. And where we further to attend to the sacred history, we shall find that after the death of Joshua and the elders, which saw the mighty works of God, that Israel first being enslaved by sin were oppressed by various nations. But when they cried unto the Lord, he raised up deliverers among them whom were Othniel, Ehud, Barak, Gideon, Jephthah, and many others which performed glorious exploits and were blessed instruments under God to deliver Israel from oppression and bondage. Some of these, you know, are spoken of as the worthies of Israel and have much recorded in their praise, and yet all these died in the faith that a defensive war is sinless before God. Still, were we to descend and pursue the chain of history, we shall find all the kings of Israel of the same faith. Among many that might be mentioned, we shall at present take notice only of one. David, a man eminent for pure religion, the sweet psalmist of Israel. David, a man after God's own heart, yet all his life is a scene of war. When he was even a youth, he began his martial exploits and delivered Israel by slaying great Goliath of Gath, the champion of the Philistines. And what shall I say more? The time would fail me to enumerate all who were of vouchers of this proposition. It is therefore a clear point that a defensive war is sinless and consistent with the purest religion. Just some excerpts. Uh, it goes on and on, but... I think you can can see uh, what he was doing. I think you probably can imagine the state of the troops after he finished preaching and uh, how that they were ready to fight. And that's the reason why that uh, Washington referred to the Baptist chaplains as the firmest friends of liberty. And others would accuse us, and uh, that's an example of the historic rewrite which Brother Beller has uh, reminded us of so often Amen. that our Baptist ancestors are accused of being cowards. They are accused of being against the foundation of this country and against the revolution. But nothing could be farther from the truth. Amen. And we understand that places like this, this pulpit here was used to blaze out the news in favor of the war for independence. We owe our Baptist ancestors, such as David Jones, for being so faithful to stand for righteousness, for being willing to engage in this defensive war. They knew what the cost was. You continue to read 
uh, the message, and you'll know that their homes, their lands, their very lives, their families were all in jeopardy because of the advancing British Army, and they were willing to defend themselves. Mm -hmm. 